Welcome to another episode of Rob Wright's Gen X Pop Culture. And on today's episode, we're going to talk about the classic Christmas special, A Charlie Brown Christmas. Uh, one of my favorites. I watch it every year. Uh, now it's on Apple TV, which I suggest if you got Apple TV, go watch it there. Um, Apple bought the rights, and it's now on their, their channel. And, you know, with streaming services, uh, it's great that you have a lot of these, but here's the problem with streaming services. Uh, they can take it down at any point, and we may never see it again. And the other uh, aspect of it is that uh, they could edit some stuff out. So uh, you never know what you're going to get. That's why I always recommend that you have it on physical media. Uh, I've got it on physical media. Probably need to upgrade it to Blu-ray, uh, but I do have it on physical media, and I suggest you two should get it on physical media just so you can watch it whenever you want. Uh, anyway, today we're going to talk about the development. We're going to talk a little bit about, about the production. Uh, we'll talk about the casting, the animation, of course, the music, and I'll talk about the reception. This was an interesting uh, story, and it was the breakout of the uh, the Peanuts comic into cartoon and animation uh, features. So without any further ado, let's get into this. So Peanuts was a very popular comic strip in the 1950s. It made its debut, and it was very popular in the 1960s. Um, this, this special was made in 1965, so it was in the mid-60s when it came out. Um, so it, it had a real cultural phenomenon. Obviously, you had not only the comic strip, which, which was in several papers across the country, uh, the Thanksgiving Parade, which would have like Charlie Brown and Snoopy in different years. Uh, so the Coca-Cola Company commissioned a special, uh, and this special was written over a period of several weeks and on a small budget and done in about six months which is surprising and very fast even for that time uh, to get something out. Uh, the interesting thing in the development of it is uh, when they were casting the characters, they decided to use child actors instead of adults, which sometimes you have adult voice actors which can, can do uh, child voices, but in this case, they did children. And as you go along with the Peanuts cartoons, uh, you'll find that they cast children uh, repeatedly in these roles. So... Uh, a child actor would play uh, for a couple of years one role, and then when they got older, they would recast that role, which was interesting if you look at all the peanut specials throughout the years. And I, I of course, have been a fan and, and have watched many of the specials uh, in my childhood growing up in the 70s and 80s and 90s uh, with all of these. Um, so the program soundtrack was similarly unorthodox. It featured uh, jazz score by uh, Vince uh, Gallardi, uh, who is amazing, and it lacked a laugh track, which was common for back then, especially for comedies, uh, and it was a staple of U.S. television, but they didn't, they didn't want it, and I'll talk more about that as we go. Um, it's interesting because the network thought that, oh my goodness, you know, we only have about six months to get this out. It's going to be an epic disaster and an epic failure, and it turned out that it wasn't. Thank goodness. Um, basically... Uh, this, this special premiered in December of 1965 and it received high ratings and acclaim from critics. It also received an Emmy and a Peabody award and it became an annual presentation in the United States airing the broadcast television during the Christmas season for 56 years, uh, before becoming exclusively available on Apple TV, as I mentioned, um, its success paved the way for other, other specials, uh, like It's a Great Pumpkin, Charlie Brown, which I've already done a video on. Uh, if you haven't seen it, please watch that one. That one's really great. There's some interesting things about that. Um, it achieved commercial success, selling 5 million copies in the U.S., uh, live theatrical versions of a Charlie Brown Christmas have been staged. So this has gone on to be a, a cultural phenomenon, uh, not only watching the cartoon, but also people have developed it into a stage play, which I think is great. It's fantastic. Uh, this is a great message and a great story, and I love this special. Um, it's the first TV special based on the on Peanuts, as I said, by, by Charles Scholes. And um, it features the voice of Peter Robbins, who played Charlie Brown for, for a number of years. Um, Christopher Shea, Kathy Steinberg, Tracy Stratford, and Bill Melendez. It's produced by uh, Lee Mendelson and directed by Melendez and... It made its debut, like I mentioned, on CBS on December 9th, 1965. So it's a very interesting story, and we're going to get into a lot of the production and the casting and animation coming up. But this 
this is a cultural phenomenon, and I'm so glad they were able to produce it and that it came out because I dearly love this Christmas special. It and the Halloween one are, are two staples that I watch every year and my two favorite uh, Peanuts episodes. So let's talk a little bit more about the production. Okay, the production is an interesting story because it started out as a biography of Charles Schultz. So Lee Mendelson had done a couple of biographies and uh, biographical specials, and he did one on Willie Mays uh, that Schultz knew about, and that's why he agreed to do a biography with Lee. And when they were starting to put together the biography, uh, they suggested, hey, why don't we animate some of the comic strip for a couple minutes? And that's when Schultz... Uh, suggested Bill Mendelssohn to do the animation. Well, they tried to sell this biography to different um, different TV studios, and unfortunately it really didn't pick up any steam, and there wasn't any interest in doing a biography on Charles Schultz. Um, and the other thing is, despite the popularity of the comic strip across um, the country, advertisers weren't really interested in it. They weren't interested in a biography. They weren't interested in a special until in April of 1965, Time Magazine featured Peanuts on their cover. And it kind of prompted everything. And so what happened was uh, they turned the biography into a half-hour Peanuts Christmas special. And the Coca-Cola company happened to be looking for um, a special to sponsor during the holiday. So things just kind of aligned. And it's pretty awesome how they came together. The only problem was... They had to get a script ready uh, in less than half a week for the Coca-Cola company to present it to them so they could sell it and get it to where it could go into production and get it on air. So there was a huge rush in the production of this. So um, what happened was you had Middleson and Schultz, and the two got to work on plans for the Christmas special, and they they got the outline to Coca-Cola in time, and it consisted of a winter scenes, a school play, and a scene to be read from the Bible, and the soundtrack combining jazz and traditional music. Uh, the outline did not change over the course of the production. Uh, they had six months to make the special and completed it ten days before it aired, which was, especially for back then, which was highly unusual. Um, I know as we came along in the, the 70s and 80s, you would have uh, productions that would be finished the day of. Uh, see my Moonlighting episode for more about that, but it was unusual for uh, something to get completed 10 days prior to production because back then they had to have stuff in advance uh, so they could could use the technology and put everything in there, like the commercials and everything else. So this was highly unusual for something like that to happen. Uh, Schultz's main goal for the Peanuts-based uh, Christmas special was focused on the true meaning of Christmas, which is, ironically, other Christmas specials focused in on Santa Claus and uh, the joy of the holidays, but they didn't really... Uh, focus as much on uh, the Christian significance of Christmas, uh, the scripture. And Charles Schultz's faith in the Bible and his faith played a huge part of that. And he insisted that a scene be entered which talked about Jesus' birth. And it, that's very interesting. And I, I thought it was really great because this is one of the few specials that really does honor that, that's timeless. And it's had some controversy over the years because, uh, you know, different TV stations in different areas have tried to have that cut out, and it hasn't been cut out, and thank goodness for that. Um, the program script has been described as bare bones. It was completed in only a few weeks. In the days following the, the special sell to Coca-Cola, Middleton and animator Bill Menendez met with Schultz at his home to expand upon the ideas promised in the pitch. Middleton remembered that uh, the previous Christmas Day, he and his spouse read the Hans Christian Andersen uh, tale of the fir tree uh, to the children. And Schultz countered with the, the tree should kind of reflect the, the lead character, Charlie Brown, which you'll see here. He gets a, a tree that, that uh, may not be the greatest tree in the world, and he thinks he killed it. And if you've seen the special, the kids come, and they, they specialed it up, and it, and it turns out to be a good tree after all. So... Um, that's part of the making of it. That's part of the the brilliance of this script. It's so interesting how it all came together, and it had to come together really fast. Let's talk a little bit about the casting, animation, uh, music, and the reception. Let's get into casting and a little bit about the animation and the music. Um, 
so as I mentioned before, they they pick child actors for it, and they had to come up with child actors who match the personalities of the main characters. Of course, Charlie Brown had to be a voice that was downbeat and nondescript. Uh, Lucy had to be bold and upright, and then Linus had to convey uh, both the sophistication and childlike innocence. Um, the other funny thing was Snoopy, who had a lot of the funny scenes. Obviously, a dog wasn't a, he wasn't a talking dog in the comic strip. So what they would do is they they would have Middleson. I talked about this on the uh, Halloween special. Middleson did a lot of gibberish lines, and they put those all together for for Snoopy and how he talked. And it was quite funny. Uh, the other thing that they talked about was the fact that later on, when they had adults, um, they would have an off-screen teacher. The lines were skewed, and then they used a muted trombone uh, for the teacher, which was interesting. And you, you'll see that in later on uh, specials. So casting Charlie Brown was the most difficult process. Uh, they were looking at good acting skills, but also the ability to appear uh, nonchalant. And so uh, Peter Robbins was was picked. He was already known for some of his roles uh, on television, film, and in advertisements. And Robbins considered Charlie Brown to be uh, his favorite character that he played throughout his life. Um, unfortunately, when we talk about Robbins, um, he he had a book that came out that's that's interesting. But he had a very tragic life after this, and a lot of things happened to him. It's very sad to talk about. Uh, if you want to learn more, look it up. Uh, just love and prayers for him and his family with everything that happened to him. It's a very sad story, unfortunately. But uh, he did a wonderful job as Charlie Brown. I'll always remember him and think fondly of him for his role as Charlie Brown. Uh, Christopher Shea, who would become Linus in special, he had a slight lisp. And uh, according to Mendelssohn, it gave him a more youthful sweetness to him. And I, I think it really added the character of Linus. I do like Linus in this and several other specials. Uh, he's He and Charlie Brown are two of my favorite characters. Um, Tracy Stratford played the role of Lucy uh, with the creators who were impressed by her attitude and professionalism. Uh, Kathy Steinberg was the youngest of performers at just six years old at the time of recording. Uh, she was too young to read, so producers gave her lines to memorize and one line at a time. And it's interesting how they help these child actors to do this. Um, you'll find out if you watch the Halloween special uh, that there was particular words for Sally that they had to help her pronounce out. And it was really cool how they did this and how they got the takes. Um, he decided to have non-actors, not Hollywood uh, kids, perform on the special. And uh, he sent the, the tape recorders home with, the, with his employees uh, for the children to audition. Much of the background cast came from Mendelssohn's home neighborhood in Northern California. Um, the children were viewed at, at the script's sophisticated dialogue as edgy, finding several words and phrases among them esteemed syndicate difficult to pronounce. And they had to ha help the kids pronounce these and teach them how to pronounce these words. But I thought it was really interesting. Um, he recalled the recording sessions as chaotic with excited children running rampant. Uh, that was uh, Robbins recalling all this. Uh, recording of Charlie Brown, Chris is completed in one day, which is amazing. Uh, and the funny story here is they're in the studio completing this, and the rock group Jefferson Airplane, which went on to become Jefferson Starship, uh, as we know him today as Starship, was in the other studio. So what happened was uh, after the specials broadcast, the children – became wildly popular and uh, they'd get, gotten autographs and exchanged autographs with uh, with the uh, musicians from Jefferson Starship, which is really cool. That's that's interesting. Um, interesting fact, interesting thing. Um, the animation was completed in, in the final four months of production. CBS initially wanted an hour's worth of animation, but uh, Melendez talked them down to a half hour special, uh, believing that a half, an hour of television was just too much to shoot. Um, 13,000 drawings were made for the special at 12 frames per second to create the illusion of movement, which is incredible. Uh, Melendez had previously worked uh, for Warner Brothers and Disney, um, and it helped him on this. It helped him give him material for that. Scholl said it envisioned the special essentially talking heads, reading script. Animator uh, Bill Littlejohn recalled uh, the meeting from Schultz that when he and Melendez designed the sequence of Snoopy dancing, 
on Schroeder's piano as Schultz was concerned and distracted too much from the plot. So Schultz was, he almost had it more of people reading a script while Melendez really got the animation going. And I think Snoopy dancing on Schroeder's piano is hilarious. Uh, Snoopy is also one of my favorite characters because he just, he's all over the place and he's fun to watch. Um, I'd be reminisced if I didn't talk about the music because this is the most famous award-winning soundtrack here. Um, it was an unorthodox mix, as I mentioned, of Chris's music and jazz. Um, a ben Strauli trio was was uh, did this, and they composed the music for the project, creating the entire piece. Linus and Lucy is the main theme, and it's the main one that you're familiar with. I would play it for you, but I don't want a copyright strike from youtube on it but it's the main one that you recognize all the time that's particularly played on uh piano if you know it you know it uh, i wish i could hum it but i my musical humming is not as good and you might not get the the the, the, the exact track so i'm not going to hum it for you uh but um he spent a lot of time on this and it's it's a famous and it's used in several of the other peanut specials uh it's probably the most famous track uh for peanuts animated uh, instruments were used in the special, uh, and, uh, they were created for Linus and Lucy and also, uh, for skating and Christmas time is here, which is another song that was composed specifically for this special. Um, in the weeks preceding the uh, premiere, Mendelssohn encouraged, uh, trouble finding, a, he had trouble finding a lyricist, uh, for his instrument, instrumental trio and penned. Christmas time is here in about 15 minutes. So Christmas time is here was penned in about 15 minutes and he had trouble finding a soloist. Amazing. Interesting. But he ended up using a choir for it. So the special opens and closes the choir of children uh, for St. Paul's Episcopal Church in San Rafael, California. And they perform Christmas time is here and Hark the Herald Angels Sing. So it's a children's choir that performs both these songs. They had a Difficult time finding a soloist, so they use a children's choir, which is remarkable. It sounds great on the uh, on the show, and it's just fantastic. So it was voted in the Grammy Hall of Fame in 2007 and added to the Library of Congress, uh, its National Recording Registry list of culturally, historically, and aesthetically important American sound recordings in 2012. So kudos to the music for this and kudos to, to this animation. So let me tell you a little bit about the reception uh, of this. So um, they thought it was going to be a disaster. Um, all involved believed the special would be a disaster. Melendez first saw the completed animation uh, at a showing in the theater days before its premiere, turning to his crew of animators and remarking, my golly, we've killed it. Uh, Melendez was embarrassed, but one of the animators, Ed Levitt, was more positive regarding the special, telling him it was the best special he'd ever made. And it turned out he was right. Uh, the special received critical acclaim, like I'd mentioned, Hollywood Reporter, uh, Weekly Variety, New, New York Post, Washington Post, uh, you know, all the different papers praised it, uh, said it was charm, charming and in good taste. And it basically was just a cultural phenomenon. Like I said, it got good ratings. Everybody liked it. Uh, the film has an aggregated review score of 85% based on 20 reviews on Rotten Tomatoes, which I don't know how well you, you trust Rotten Tomatoes nowadays. That's another subject for another time. But trust me, this has been around for a long time. It's good quality stuff. Uh, CBS then ordered uh, additional peanut specials, which I get into uh, on my review of um, – it's a great pumpkin, Charlie Brown. I talked a little bit about that, but it also won an award for outstanding children's program in 1966, and it was just one of the top shows ever made. Uh, when the Christmas special aired, it was second. Uh, it was second on the books to Bonanza, which is phenomenal for that that time because Bonanza just ruled the ruled the 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 stations, and you know it was number two behind that, which is just incredible. Uh, let's talk a little bit about my favorite scenes on the next slide and we'll wrap this up. So it's hard to pick favorite scenes from this show. I love the whole thing. Um, I love some of the lines with Lucy where Lucy and Charlie Brown are talking and she's giving him uh, psychological advice. That's always funny. It's always hilarious to, to, to see her talk to Charlie Brown about it. 
Uh, of course, in this scene, her with Schroeder, where Schroeder's playing Beethoven, and then she's asking him to play Jingle Bells, and he does the do do do, uh, which is just it's hilarious. Um, Snoopy dancing on Schroeder's uh, piano is hilarious and fun. I do love how Charlie Brown goes and picks out a tree, and he picks picks out one, and and people think it's not that great, and he takes it and he puts the 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 ball on it, and he thinks he killed it. And that's just such a tender, tender moment. And it reminds me of the different Christmas tree stories uh, from my family. I may tell you a few of them um, at a later date, but I'll tell you one that involved my brother and I going to get a Christmas tree, uh, which was hilarious. So dad gave us some money and I was like 16 or 17 at the time and I had had a truck. Uh, So we went out to go get the Christmas tree. And at that time, uh, Christmas trees, there were specialty stores like uh, that would sell Christmas trees. And my brother and I, we went out and we went to go get a tree. And by golly, we were going to get the biggest tree that we could find. So we, we went to the lot and we got a huge, humongous tree. I mean, this tree was was massive. It was like eight or nine feet. Uh, huge for a, a great tree. I love the tree. We got it in my truck. We got it in and we got it. Uh, back to my dad's house and uh, dad thought that hey it'd be a great adventure for his two sons to go and we lo and behold we come back with this huge tree and the first thing about it was the base that we had for uh for many years was not big enough for this tree so the first thing we had to do was buy a new base because typically what you do is you you back then you you buy the crystal tree and you you touch the base so you can give it water so it'll stay for for christmas so we, we got a new base for the tree and uh, we got it. And it was so big and so massive that unfortunately at one point it fell on my stepmom and we had to help pick it up off of her. But uh, this tree was so big, it kept falling over and we had to get an, an even bigger base for it. Finally got the bigger base for it and uh, the water for it and um, the tree stood up. But it was the biggest tree we ever had. And uh, from that point on, my brother and I weren't allowed to go by ourselves to pick out a new tree because uh, we just we just picked the biggest one. So um, it's interesting, and it's it's kind of funny to to talk about Christmas tree stories. And, and I see Charlie Brown who picks out a, a tree, and it it doesn't work out as well for him. So funny stuff there. So I love that with Charlie Brown. I love the ending where the kids kind of rally around him and they put together the tree, and it turns out to be um, the great uh, redemption of it and how they sing and Merry Christmas and they accept Charlie Brown and it's just awesome. It's just heartwarming there. But my favorite scene has got to be, um, when Linus, uh, recites scripture and he goes into Luke and it's Luke chapter two verses eight through 14, where he tells a little bit about the, the Christmas story with the angel appearing to the wise men. I think it's very important around Christmas time. I think sometimes we get caught up in, uh, and the different specials and the different aspects of the joys of Christmas, but we often forget the reason for Christmas. And I think this special really nails it, and that's why it's so great and why I'm glad that it hasn't been cut out of the special uh, yet. And it always could, and that's the, the, the dangers of having uh, it go into to social media and, and go into a streaming platform where they have edited stuff out of um out of your classics. Anyway, what are your favorite scenes from Charlie Brown Christmas? Uh, do you watch it every year? Is, was it a staple in your childhood? It was a staple in my childhood. We watched it all the time. Uh, let me know your thoughts below. Don't forget to like and subscribe, and we'll see you in the next one.